This is your first video in College Algebra Dual Credit. My name is Lindsay Pennington and we're going to get started with uh, real numbers. A lot about what we discussed today will be review for you so these terms should hopefully be familiar and uh, we're going to start off with the properties of equality. The first one is the reflexive property which says that if you have a number A it's going to be equal to A. So the number is always equal to itself. So 2 is always equal to 2. The symmetric property says if A, a number, remember these represent numbers, if A is equal to B, then we can also say that B is equal to A. The last one is the principle of substitution. And that just means if I say A is equal to B, Um, then I can substitute B for A in any expression that contains A. So if I say a is equal to 2, then I can substitute 2 for anywhere I see an, see an a. And so these are all things that you should be familiar with but may not remember the um, proper term for. Moving on to our next topic, it's uh, about sets. And there are two ways we describe sets. One is the roster method and one is a set builder notation. And anything that's within the set, whether it be an object or a number or a letter, the things that are within the set are called elements of the set. With the roster method, this says that set D is equal to 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. You list out all of the elements in the set. Um, with set builder notation, however, you can uh, list an interval of things. And so here's how we read set builder notation. And this is supposed to be a line that did not transfer to my program. And so let me rewrite this. D equals X. And the way we read this is such that, that's what this line stands for, it's all the numbers that are in between 0 and 9. So this reads set D is equal to any x such that x is in between 0 and 9. And so this um, particular set would include numbers that are decimals and so on and so forth, not just uh, whole numbers like we see up here. When we're using set builder notation and the roster method both, um, the elements are not listed twice and order does not matter. So I can if I have two twos in a set, I'm only going to list one two. And I don't have to go in order um, numerically. It can be in any order that I want. And then we have another thing called a subset, which is kind of exactly like it sounds like. Um, so if everything in, of set A is also in set B, meaning like A can fit inside set B, then um, A is a subset of B. So, for example, if I have set A is equal to, I'm going to use the roster method, 1, 2, and 3. Roster method is, is good when you just have a short, um, small set. And set B is equal to 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. I would say that A is a subset of B uh, because everything that's within A, 1, 2, and 3, is also in set B. Now we're going to classify numbers. Um, there are several different categories that these numbers uh, fit under. Uh, first are the natural numbers, also referred to as counting numbers. And so this would be a set of numbers that includes 
one, two, three, four, and dot, 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 all in one arm. So no decimals, no fractions, and no zero, or negative numbers. Uh, the next one is a set of whole numbers. Whole numbers has everything the natural numbers has, including zero. So we just added a zero. Integers is a set that includes negative numbers, zero, and positive numbers. So negative two, and I need a dot, dot, dot here. Negative one, zero, one, two, and on uh, infinitely. Rational numbers are any number that can be written as a fraction. So I can write two as a fraction, two over one, so it's also a rational number. Or you can think of it as um, any kind of fraction like you normally would. Uh, one fourth, these are just examples, not a complete list. Two thirds, it also includes decimals, and it can be a repeating decimal. Like two thirds is .6666 repeating, and so that is still considered a rational number. And then we also have irrational numbers. Now, I can't be irrational and rational at the same time. I have to be one or the other. So if I have an irrational number, it can't be any of these above things. It can't be rational, it can't be integer, it can't be whole, it can't be natural. It can only be an irrational number, which also falls under the real numbers we're going to talk about. So an example of a rational number would be pi. Because um, pi is represented as a uh, um, decimal that never terminates. It never ends, and there is no repetition within it, like we had with the .66 repeating. Um, another example of an irrational number would be the square root of 2. That's because the square root of 2 is, a de is in decimal form, neither repeats nor terminates. And then the real numbers are just the irrational numbers together with the rational numbers. Those two sets, whoops. The, rational, uh, the real numbers are the rational numbers and the, real, and the irrational numbers together. Those two num number groups um, make up the set of real numbers. And later on we'll talk about the uh, complex number system, also referred to as the imaginary number system. This just gives you a visual um, of the real number system. You can see that the real number system includes irrational numbers and it also includes rational numbers. And so if I have an integer, I know that that integer um, is an integer and also a rational number which fits into the real number system. If I have a natural number, that number is also whole, it's also an integer, it's also rational, and it's also real. So when you go to classify numbers, this chart will hopefully come in handy for you. Next we need to discuss the properties of the real number system. Uh, we have commutative which just means that the order you do things doesn't matter when you're adding or multiplying. And that's important, adding and multiplying. Order does not matter. So 2 plus 3 equals 5 is the same thing as 3 plus 2 equals 5. Or if I did 4 times 2, that's 8, and 2 times 4 is 8. Same thing. And then you have the associative property, which says that the way you group things doesn't matter if you're adding or multiplying. So 2 times 3 gives me 6 times 4 is 24 and likewise if I come over here and do 3 times 4 I get 12 and 12 times 2 is also equal to 24 and the last one is the distributive property and the distributive property um, just means you have to distribute or give away a term to other parts within the parentheses um, sometimes I refer to this as the party favor property because you have to give when you have a little party like when you're in second grade you have to give away party favors and everybody at the party gets one so in this case the party favor is the two and I have to give that two to everybody inside the parentheses which would be like everybody at the party so that would be two times two x which is four x and two times negative four which is negative eight that's the distributed property Okay, when we're talking about the identity properties, um, you can kind of think of it as when you look in a mirror, you see yourself um, or your identity. And so 
I'm trying to figure out the number that is the identity, what would I add to x to get x in return? And so the additive identity is 0 because x plus 0 is equal to x. Um, in multiplication, the multiplicative identity, what number would I multiply x by to get x in return? And I know that that number is 1 because x times 1 is equal to x. Okay, so I know that um, the identity in addition is 0. And when I'm talking about uh, the inverse, the inverse is something I'm going to use to try to get back to the identity. And when I'm talking about addition, it's often called the opposite. So for example, the additive inverse of 8 is negative 8, which this little PowerPoint didn't exactly do very good. Negative 8, because when I add these together, I get back to the identity. And that was my goal. So the inverse is something you use to get back to the identity. And this number was uh, the inverse um, of this particular problem. You're going to use the multiplicative inverse in much the same way because that's also a number that you're trying to use to get back to the identity. Okay, so for example, the multiplicative inverse of 8 is 1 over 8 because, oh, this messed up again. 8 times 1 over 8 is equal to 1, and 1 represents the identity in multiplication. So the uh, multiplicative inverse of 8 is 1 over 8, and we often refer to that as the reciprocal. All right, now absolute value, something we should be familiar with. The absolute value of a number is its distance from 0 on the real number line. Now, and uh, these little bars are called absolute value bars, and so the absolute value of negative 3 is equal to 3 because it's 3 units away from 0 on the number line. Uh, this little guy down here, I was looking for a number line online and I just like the frog so he doesn't really mean anything. He's just there to make you smile. And while I was searching for that um, absolute value number line uh, example online, I came across this little cartoon and I thought it was funny so I thought I'd share it with you too. Sometimes it's helpful to use a number line if you're trying to order a bunch of numbers. Um, and I found it easiest if you change them to decimals and then order them. Um, and then really, you may not even need to use a number line. If you change them all to decimals, it's just an example for you to refer back to. We've just got a couple more things to talk about. Uh, the first of which is the domain of a variable. And that's a set of value, values that a variable may assume. Um, for example, in this particular expression, 5 divided by x minus 2, I need to determine the domain that the variable x can assume. Um, can x be any number that I put in there? Well, no, x can't, because if I get a denominator of 0 here, then um, that's not allowed. So the domain in this case um, is, and I'm going to use set builder notation, x such that x cannot equal 2. Since if x equals 2, the denominator would be 0, which is not allowed. And so um, x can take on any value except for 2 in this case. And that's true most oftentimes when you have a denominator. Um, you just don't want this, this bottom part of the, the uh, fraction to be uh, equal to 0. Also a domain question, uh, what would the domain for the variable be in the formula for the circumference of a circle? Well, the circumference of a circle is circumference equals 2 pi r, or you can think of it as pi d also, but we're going to say 2 pi r. So what, can, which was, what is the variable first of all? Well, I know that the variable is r. Um, and so in a circle, which since r represents the radius, what can a radius be? Can a radius be negative? No, measurements can't be negative. So I know that the domain can't be any negative number. Can the radius be zero? No, because then you wouldn't have a circle. Uh, so in this case, the domain is going to be 
any positive real number. So you can write it as x such that x is any positive real number. So that takes into account any number that is bigger than zero. It can be a decimal, it can be a fraction, as long as it is larger than zero. And you don't always have to use set builder notation like I did here. You could just say the domain is um, any positive real number. Um, I just like to practice with the set builder notation for you. Last little thing here, um, I didn't want to go into a whole long spiel about order of operations because you've been doing that since 1972. So um, here's just a little chart to try to help you remember um, order of operations. And the thing that messes most people up, especially since y'all have been in upper level math classes and probably haven't done order of operations in a, in a long time, um, remember when you get to multiplication and division, it's whichever comes first from left to right. And same thing with add, addition and subtraction, whichever's first um, from left to right. And just to end on a, I think, a funny note, um, is this little cartoon. Now, this thing at the bottom, I don't think it's that you don't have friends if you get this joke. It's that just all the friends that you have are probably geeky and nerdy. But and that's okay. You can be geeky and nerdy. So I'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a good night.